Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's always fun to come and talk with a, uh, such a grandiose title. Uh, so uh, we'll get right into it. So this is a um, Beyond the Abstract, which you might or have, might not read, which is totally fine. Uh, this is a, a, a talk that goes over um, my sort of big picture, all-encompassing understanding of how to do software better, sort of organizationally and process-wise. So uh, I've got some other buddies from Pivotal who can, uh, as Josh Long did yesterday, and Mark and Matt Stein, who can sit down and code with you and things like that. But uh, if you saw my presentation yesterday, you might remember that I'm no longer good at my job. I'm good at PowerPoint. So that's what I'm going to give uh, you here. But if you are in an organization that's looking to figure out how to improve how it applies software and uses it to do whatever it is your organization does for profit, or maybe you like just burning up people's money, or you're trying to service citizens or things like that, Hopefully, it's something helpful if, if you're in, in the IT world. So first of all, uh, just to introduce myself, this is me up here. Uh, one, one lovely summer at SeaWorld down in San Antonio. I think it was maybe even cooler than it is outside in uh, Krakow here today. You guys have some nice Texas weather. Uh, so I'm, I'm Cote. I work at Pivotal at the moment in uh, a team that does a lot of going out and explaining what we do. You might call them the evangelist team or things like that. We call them advocates, because no one wants to be called an evangelist nowadays. Uh, and I've been at Pivotal for almost two years now. And also in my career, I've worked as an industry analyst, mo mostly focusing on infrastructure software and software development and software and, and other things like that at two different firms. At this one firm, Redmonk, which uh, is, is an exciting little, they used to be called boutique firms, but it's a very small firm that has a, a large impact that's worth, worth looking into. And I also worked at 451 Research, where I headed up the team of people who worked on def, uh, covering infrastructure software and software development and sundry other items like that. So living in Austin, I have a, uh, uh, this, a compulsory tour at Dell for two years that I have to do. So I work there in corporate strategy and M&A, which is another exciting way of picking up a different mindset of how technology and software is applied when you're working on the strategy, albeit at a vendor, but you're thinking about how this vendor makes money off of software and how their customers do it, and, and you're working on acquisitions and things like that. And then before that, back when I did so-called real work, I was a software developer for about 10 years at places large and small, working on all sorts of things, from really boring things like telling you when your servers are down to uh, really exciting things like letting you buy boots online in the 90s, which I think we sold like two pairs. Uh, and if, if you enjoy my, my uh, prattling and nonsense, I have a lot of stuff you can find at my website. And I write a column at the, the Register Monthly, kind of on DevOps and uh, Agile and things like that. Um, I do a weekly podcast called Software Defined Talk that it's always good to have more listeners. Uh, and and if, if you enjoy kind of talking about the industry and things like that in a casual way, me and two other people uh, work on that quite a bit. So let's start off with what's going over on over in business land. Right? Like, uh, computers are fun. They're delightful. They're sort of like a little rat trap in their own, a, a little uh, pleasantly uh, temperate, you know, one of those big hedge mazes you can just get lost in and really forget why you were there in the first place and uh, have a good time nonetheless. So it's always nice to pull back and see why we're doing this. What's, what's motivating organizations to want to spend all this lavish money to have people come sit in a well air conditioned conference room, just have someone prattle on about slides and things like that? So let's take a look at what's happening in, in, in the business world. And, and you'll pardon it being a little uh, US-centric, but these are kind of global companies, so they, they tend to have the same problems uh, as, as we traipse about. So we see this situation a lot, kind of epitomized by this, uh, this big, well-tanned guy up here. This is the, the, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. And this is from a, uh, his shareholder letter, so the annual letter you send out to everyone who owns the company, or nominally. Uh, uh, last year, 2015, so I guess it's a little dated, but it really sums up a lot of what, what I see and what people see happening in the business world, and that is there was a time, time was, when business was very stable, and you could be a large bank and establish yourself, or a large telco, or a large retail operation, or insert whatever sort of large business where people wear ties, and you know, unless they're kind of jaunty and they have that top button undone and stuff, but they do a lot of dry cleaning, and they're riding around in cars and things like that. Uh, but these businesses, they could establish themselves, and they, very little things could threaten them, and therefore they could extract a, a nice margin or profit. They had competitive advantage, as, as the uh, academics like to call it. 
But what's happened over the recent decades, and, and we started to see this uh, you know, early, you know, in the 90s or so, is that through many, many factors, IT is just one of these factors, but through many factors, including globalization and other things like that, it's much easier for companies to be threatened and for someone to come and take their business from them. The barriers to entry aren't as high, people are more willing to try new things, and then, and then you know, even though I kind of dismissed it, IT, computers, software, mobile, all these things, really create a new avenue to compete with these companies, right? So here is where I would usually, uh, if I did this kind of thing, have the obligatory mention of people like Uber and Airbnb and all these other people who are disrupting giant industries. So you can kind of insert that narrative in your head that I'm sure you've heard a million times. But what you see in this letter is the response that, that, that we're seeing a lot now, and, and also to be frank, a lot of who Pivotal sells to, are large companies that, that are recognizing this and they want to do something about it. They're realizing that among, again, many other things, how they use IT, how they use custom written software is very important to how they're going to survive in the future and what they're going to do. And, you know, just to uh, very early on break the first rule of not putting lots of words on slides, I'm, I'm always uh, excited about doing that. I mean, th this is a, another, if you want to dig deeper into this, this is something I would point you to, is this idea of transient advantage. And you heard me mention competitive advantage earlier. Uh, you know, if you if ever tried to put yourself to sleep by reading Michael Porter, or even better, a summary of it, you have a notion of what competitive advantage is and all these various forces and strange little chevrons and things. But the idea of transient advantage is a very academic uh, take that's backed up with some, some you know, MBA-level research, if you will, that shows the effect of, the la of, of competitive advantage wearing away, that companies are coming and going, and it's much more difficult to stay on, on track. And therefore, they must innovate more frequently. They need to come up with new businesses and new functionality and capability, which is something us in the tech world are very used to, right? Like, we, we even have, as I'll get to, we have this idea of legacy software, and we, we make fun of people who don't learn and do new things. Like, for us, always keeping up is something uh, that we do. But in the business world, it's not so much a notion. But there's figures like this, that since 2000, staying on top, being listed on the Fortune 500, has been very difficult. Back in the 60s and 70s, it was easy to stay on, on the, top, the top of the list for you know, 60, 70 years or so. But now, over half of those companies have dropped off. And granted, some of that's through mergers and things like that. But usually, companies aren't acquired unless they're in a uh, sort of less than ideal situation by, by a larger company. So there's a lot of churn there. And again, uh, I put the URL for my slides up at the beginning you know, in case you want to dig into the footnotes more. But it's, it's a good reference for figuring out the business climate. So don't worry, I'll get out of business world very quickly here. Uh, so just to kind of sum up this section, right? Like, this is, like I said, these are a bunch of my big grand theories of things. I was an analyst, so you've always got to come up with big theories. But this kind of gets to my uh, cloud native business theory. Hopefully the only person who puts the word business next to cloud native in all the, uh, the, the marketing world. Uh, so if we're in this era of, uh, not to read the slide to you, but you know, you're in this era of needing to innovate more and more, and we really expect IT and software to function and, and provide something like that. But as we'll get into, when you look at how IT is functioning in large organizations, it doesn't really work like that. In the tech world, it does, right? Because that's our product. If you're working at a technology company or a vendor, and so you're always churning over it. But in, in, in the rest of the world, uh, most people are not really behaving in a way where they're using software as the core enabler, that fungible thing that gets updated and deployed and observed every week to actual users that, that pe folks are, are doing. So that's something we need to change and address. And that is what, what's, what is meant by better ways of doing software. Getting to that point as, as mostly a large organization, but any organization is what we'll be going over. So to start with, uh, for any given Pivotal presentation, apparently this is a required slide. So uh, I've put this in, if you saw uh, Matt Stein's presentation. I, I would point your attention to this little cat down here, which you may have missed the first time you saw this picture. And you can sort of dream and figure out what's going on with that. I'm not really sure what that represents or does. There's also a castle over there, which is another interesting mystery. Uh, but much of what you hear and why I put together presentations like this uh, are basically advice and anecdotes and overview about this class of people, the, the sort of unicorns, the, the most awesomest people out there who more than anything else prove themselves maybe to be sort of like vanguard thought leaders, people who are figuring themselves, figuring out new ways of doing things, but they become the exception that, that you really can't track yourself to so well, right? Like if you ever find yourself thinking like, why don't we use a six page like memo like Amazon does? Or, why are we not like deploying software every day or something like that? Then you've sort of been like brainwashed a little too much by, by the unicorn class and you're not figuring out how to make things mesh 
with, with the actual real world company that you're working in. Now, the whole point is, is to be as unicorny as you can. Last year I had this notion of uh, we're all sort of donkeys, you know, hardworking beasts of burden that don't get enough respect. And our goal is really to find some sort of stable carrot and tape it onto our heads so that we can start acting like unicorns rather than uh, having unrealistic goals of, of what we can be doing. But, and, and, and that, that, you know, coincidentally gets, gets to the, uh, the state that I see most IT departments in, right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if over here you're familiar with, uh, uh, how familiar you are with Winnie the Pooh, but one of the more, I, I'm pretty sure this was the IT department in those stories, the good old Eeyore, who lived in, you know, basically, uh, if I remember, a house made out of sticks, didn't have very good budget, people didn't really respect him, he was always kind of mopey, seemed like something was wrong with him. And he always had this attitude that like things couldn't really improve. And that's, you know, what you kind of encounter, uh, especially when I go out and talk with, with a lot of IT people, is they are living in a, in a house of sticks and they're, they're quite moody and they don't seem like, they feel like they can contribute very much to the business. And indeed, when you look at surveys, uh, and, and I've highlighted the part you can look at so you can focus on my busy slide on just that. When you look at surveys that ask, uh, how is IT doing? Is IT helping the business out? Is it, is it uh, helping the business innovate, right? So if you remember the cloud native business theory and all that gobbledygook from the beginning, essentially businesses need to innovate and come up with new processes. A good way of doing that is to use custom written software, right? That, that, the same way that we would expect tech companies or what we think of as tech companies doing that. So we're gonna go to the IT department and be like, hey buddies, Eeyores, why don't you make a bunch of software for me? I'm gonna, I'll be back. I gotta go uh, cut some deals and things like that. But when you look at this chart, you can see that over the past three years, the business side of the house, uh, it's basically about 60% uh, of IT isn't very useful for them, if I'm doing my math incorrectly. 70% of, of, of IT is not really being found very helpful. You know, charts like this are always fun, like a three-year year-over chart, because you're like, oh, look how great it was three years ago, but it was embarrassing three years ago too, right? Like half of IT was not very useful. So you see this, you see this, uh, this is sort of some sort of like data, if you will, but you feel, you see, I see this uh, qualitatively, sort of anecdotally and quantitatively when, when you go out there, that we really need to improve in aggregate how, how IT is functioning, because more and more companies will be creating custom written software, so we need to improve that. So let's look at the, an example of one of the end goals of what, of what you do, right? And this is, this is a, sort of an illustration of how Pivotal goes about doing, doing software. But this is, uh, you know, and you might recognize this as a continuous delivery pipeline, like, or, or, or whatnot, but, you know, we'll go over a lot of, of getting to this kind of place, but this encapsulates the full end-to-end -end cycle and lifespan uh, that, that's missing a little bit of running it, which, which I should add on at some point. But in, including actually running it in production, you have this notion of the full end-to-end -end process of software. And the first thing to think about is, is when I encounter people, especially who are managing IT and thinking about IT, they don't really have this full end-to-end -end view. Things are siloed out in, in a tremendous way. And the other thing they don't have is, is the very user-centric, design-centric approach where they're actually studying what the problem is, getting feedback through it, planning the software out, and really treating the software not like that uh, shack of sticks, but really one of the more valuable palaces that they have in their business, one of the things they really need to nurture and spend money on. And as, as we'll get into, there, there's a part that, that I always like to add at the bottom, this feedback loop, which is another thing is, it's a symptom, if you're lacking this, of something that you need to focus on and, and a way that you can improve more, is that once you actually are deploying your software weekly or daily, once you as an organization understand this whole process up here and how you're using software, you need to actually pay attention to this feedback that you're getting from users, what they're doing, what's not working, and you need a process that brings that back and improves that process over and over again. And that idea of, you know, there's always lots of phrases we use for this, you know, continuous learning or being a learning organization or whatever, right? Like, but setting up that kind of process, that's the ultimate end goal that we have is getting to that point where you're, you're operating like this or however it is you choose to, uh, to, to operate in a way that allows you to deploy in a frequent way, get feedback and continuously improve the software you have. So a lot of the other talks in this conference go over various aspects of this, mostly on the, uh, let's see, on your right side, the, the sort of development microservices, 12-factor app thing, and I'll just lightly touch on that stuff. But if, if we're getting to the, the, to the, the point where we want to think, how do we enable uh, this process of, of doing software better, of having an, an iterative, feedback-driven way, a user-centric way of getting software out that we're doing it every week? 
I think at the moment, these three, these three pillars, if you will, all supported by, by technology, a stack, a platform running it, are the things, the initiatives, the programs you need to start focusing on. And I'll, I'll touch on each of these a little bit. But first, you have this idea, uh, all of the, the, you know, for lack of a better phrase, all of the theory and the practices and the things behind DevOps, which, true to its name, combining development operations together at a very high level is about the idea that if we're paying attention to the full life cycle of the software, developing it and running it and everything, we should probably have these two forces, these developers and operations people, the, the, the programmers and the production people, working very closely together. And indeed, if we're deploying weekly or daily, we kind of have to, because the, the way you get resilience and uptime in that type of software, you, really, you don't have time to communicate between two different groups. You need to have them combined together. And, and then, you know, at the core of a lot of this, um, like I said, the previous slide was kind of an illustration of a type of continuous delivery uh, thinking. And continuous delivery means a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the four or 500 pages. You can beat yourself over the head about it if, if, you're, if you want to get the details. But essentially, it is the, 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 the core of this process of always delivering software, always being integrated. A lot of the practices of not only code health and hygiene, but again, your production concerns and how you manage all the artifacts of production and operations and how you, the business responds to it are wrapped up in this idea of continuous delivery. And then finally, whenever you change the uh, sort of delivery dynamics of software, right, from, from being a punch card to a green screen to maybe like a little dot matrix printout to a, a flashing terminal to like a GUI to a, a web app and maybe there's a little PDA in there and then you have a mobile thing, like you sort of change the way you're delivering the, the release cadence, all of these things. That typically has, also because we get bored with the previous generation of, of architectures and, and software. Like, there was a funny question in the previous thing, like, well, there's this Java streaming thing that's basically this. Why didn't we just use that? And I don't know, because we get bored. We do new things all the time. So there's all these contributing factors, and you have new styles of architecture and development that really, less, being less snarky and sarcastic about it, they do lend themselves to this model of delivering on a daily basis and rapid delivery and having a very more of a transient way to your architecture. And that's why people prattle on about microservices and 12-factor apps and so much. Is, that's the technical underpinnings of, of a lot of what's, what's going on to support this mode of operating. So. Let's jump into uh, enabling some of these things. And I always like to start with the process, the, the people issues, because as, as we'll see, those are often the, the core items uh, that you need to worry about, right? Technology is fun and delightful, but very, very, uh, very rarely is it actually an issue or a problem. It's more, it's more getting the, uh, the meatware, as I like to call it, uh, aligned and, and reprogrammed, right? Like your software and your hardware, not a big dish issue, but uh, people, the meat, the meatware are, are a problem. And to prove that, here's, uh, here's, here's just one chart of many, right? Like, there's all sorts of surveys you can go out where uh, analysts love to go out and ask people what's wrong with them. Why, why are they depressed? Why are things failing? And this is one of the more recent ones that is available freely if you want to go read it. But you can see, when asked basically, why are your software projects failing, if you read through these, technology is like way down there somewhere, if I remember. But all of these are meatware issues, right? These are all people and the process that you're following which should indicate, if you have an engineering mindset, that's probably where I should go to fix the problems, right? Like, it's a good idea that if you identify what's causing problems to go there and fix them, just to go a little lean crazy on you. Uh, so that starts to become the focus of what you spend a lot of your time on, as, as we'll get into, is fixing your people problems, your meatware issues. So first of all, to use another multi-use fantastic chart that, that uh, I think has pretty good coloring, uh, like, this is, this is a chart from a, from a Gartner survey, and what it does is it goes over, and when we're looking at addressing our people problems, making sure our meatware is performing, this isn't all of them or necessarily the best list, but it's a pretty, pretty pragmatically useful list of agile practices. And, you know, it's, I would more think of it as lowercase agile if, if you make that kind of uh, fine distinction. But what you can do with this chart is a few things. One, you can read through all these practices, and when you think about how you do software, ask yourself, do I know what that is, and do we practice it? And you know, if I know what it is and we don't practice it, do we have a good reason not to do it? Right? And this gives you a good way to benchmark yourself and figure out how you're doing from the beginning and if you're doing things well. Now, what's also interesting about this is you can look at this and see, because it's a survey, how your peers are doing, and therefore, in general, the aggregate of people doing it. It has a pretty small end, but the council they put together, I think, is pretty representative of, of large organizations globally. 
But what you can conclude from that is that, you know, if I remember the way I always do this math, like Agile as, as a notion is basically 20 years old or so, right? I think the XP book came out in 89 or something, so it's not exactly 20 years. And I'm sure there was like the C2 wiki and all sorts of people scurrying about with post-it notes trying to sort stuff out and things like that. So let's just say 20 years, which that seems like a long time. Uh, as I get older, it doesn't seem like that long. But it seems like a long time. And basically, if you look at this list, we're pretty far from being, doing Agile as a whole, right? There's still a lot of non-Agile development out there. And these techniques are very proven to be effective in work, and yet we don't do them. Right? Again, it's sort of like a person problem. The code will do whatever you want, but if the person refuses to follow these practices, then you're in this situation where there's really not that many uh, people doing it. Now, I, I should have mentioned, there, to read this chart, you know, the way, to interpret the way I did, you basically add together the blue and the green, and those are people who are doing Agile uh, versus people who are planning on it, which might as well be not doing it, uh, or not doing it at all. So figure out if you're doing Agile well. That's the first tip. Uh, now, the, the next thing is just a mindset that you need to have. And, and you know, I purposely put the well-coiffed or, or the guy with the fancy hair uh, up there because, again, a lot of what you need to do to shift to a new way of thinking about software, what you might even think is a realistic way of thinking about software, is dealing with this notion that I encounter all the time. And more, peop more people than not, even some engineers, although not always, more people than not are like the, uh, the, the guy up there, the business guy. Like They have this idea of software that doesn't really match reality, like how software works. And therefore, the way they ask about it and manage their expectations often fall short, right? So I was talking with someone when I, uh, I, I had a little stop off in Warsaw to, to do a meet up there, and I was talking with someone. I, I think the way they think about it is, I don't know if, if you ever watch those old like uh, submarine and like Navy movies, right? Or maybe even a science fiction movie with space stuff. And inevitably, at some point in that movie, something breaks in the ship. And they've got to get these big schematics out. Like maybe they've got some laser projected thing, or maybe it's just like some old Russian submarine and they roll out some schematics. And like they find this like one point where all they have to do is go and like, you know, weld something or put a piece of gum there. And then like everything's fine and they save the day. And I think people think software is like that. Like we've got these magic schematics and you just go fix something and then the business keeps operating. But we all know it doesn't really operate that way. Software, there's no schematics. You're not in a submarine in the first place, you know, dancing around with coconuts and stuff. Like it's, it's a very complicated affair and you can't really expect it to do what you want. And so if you structure it in a schematic way, you're going to get terrible results. And instead, you need to structure it in a way that deals with the kind of wily nature of software. That you're basically, every time you're working with software, you're figuring out something new and having to learn a new way of doing it and cope with something new around it. You want to be like, more like this dog down here, right? Which is a, sort of like, I think he's my spirit animal. He's like, one, he's got a computer, so that's nice. And look, he's got two screens, although he's not using one of them. I don't know what's up with that. His productivity is halved, I guess. But like, he's just admitting, like, I have no idea what's going on, right? But I do know, if I'm operating in this kind of context, I'm going to come up with a process that lets me discover all the time what's going on and get better at it, rather than being more arrogant and fist pumpy. So to summarize a whole bunch of ideas, so what is this way of thinking about and dealing with software? I like to think of it as a small batch approach. And if you've read things like the Lean Startup or all sorts of Lean stuff, people like to put Lean in front of stuff, just like they like to put gluten-free in front of things nowadays. But they all kind of speak to this idea. And going all the way back, I think it was uh, Sir Francis Bacon who came up with this chart way back when, which we basically call the scientific method, which is if you have no idea what's going on, the, the, the proven thought technology we have to work is come up with a theory. I think that uh, I'll use a case from the uh, Internal Revenue Service uh, that Pivotal worked on, the, um, uh, the, the tax collecting agency uh, in, in the US. I think that there, there are people out there who owe us money, because uh, you know, we're the government, or, or who would like to help fund their own well-being by giving some of their money over to the government. Uh, and sometimes they're a little reluctant to give that money, and they haven't given it to us yet. So they owe us some money. And I would like to provide a way that doesn't include calling us and waiting on hold and being really expensive to inform them how much they owe. So maybe I'd like to use a computer uh, and have a little app and they'll log into this app, and if I show them how much money they owe, they'll understand that and then pay us the money. So there's a theory. All I need to do is put together a little application and present to them how much money they owe, and these people will give us money for it. And I, this, is a, this is a big, gigantic case, but if we narrow down on how do we present that amount of money, and uh, you know, the, 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 the way they tested this theory is they did a user-centric, some prototyping and a design, and their first idea was like, well, what we should do is, uh, because we're computer people, we have this huge data set, we'll show them every single financial transaction 
that they've had with us. Just like if you log into a bank, because I mean, that's what people want, right? I've got spreadsheets and I balance my checkbook every week because it's great. So their theory was that, that that would be the way they do it. So they present this huge financial thing and when they actually run the experiment, so they had a theory, they figured out how a way to validate it and they asked, did it work? And then they came back and it was confusing. People were like, I just want to know how much money I owe, not payments I've done and all this stuff. And so because they were using this cycle, because they admitted they didn't know what was happening and had, didn't, they didn't have a 12-month cycle of market requirements and things like that, they went back and redesigned. And when you say it out loud, it sounds kind of obvious. They had a table that just showed you how much money you owed. That's it. It was just like listed, you owe like $500, done. And then that worked perfectly. But if they hadn't had this approach, if they had instead waited 12 months, delivered the software, and figured out that it didn't quite work, they'd have to wait another 12 months before they could deliver it out. But they structured this small batch approach to, to work on that way. Now, there's a bunch of references down there and things like that, including a, a longer post that, that I wrote. But this is the core of, of what you're trying to enable when, when you're getting to doing software uh, in, in a better way and improve how software is done. And this is what, how software companies and tech vendors operate, right? They don't operate on these 12, 24-month cycles. That would, be, that would be terrible for them. <clears throat> to break the rule of text again, uh, delightfully, uh, a lot of people, uh, when they encounter many of these notions, uh, they start freaking out about risk management and auditors and how things are going to go terribly wrong. Like, oh my God, if we don't know what we're doing and we don't plan it out, then surely it's going to fail and then everything will be lots of... Our smoke tests are actually going to be like fire tests as the house burns down. And, and like, basically, I, I think... I think that could be true in some instances, right? Like, uh, in theory, like, there's always the air traffic controller stuff and space shuttles and bridges and stuff like that, which probably software should not be involved in that much at this point in its life, but we have to figure out something. Uh, but indeed, in fact, like, I think if you, if you think about it, if you have a small batches approach, there's actually a lot of risk that you're addressing. Things can be done more safely because there is a more disciplined approach to things, or at least there is, there's a lot more visibility and you have a lot more frequency to inspect things that are going on. I mean, the first risk that you addressed, hopefully that, that you, uh, you cottoned on to or thought about, was that you address the risk of deploying software that's useless, right? Like, that's really the biggest risk with any piece of software is you develop it and you put it in production and it's not useful. It's not what people wanted, it's not productive. But if you're deploying every week or every day and you're studying how people interact with it, then obviously you're, you're going to have a much better chance of making software that's useful. And also, you know, again, there's, there's more references you, you can read down there, but if you think about it, you have a much finer grain control over budget, right? It may not be a great outcome, but at any given point, you can kill the project after a week, right? You don't have to have a big gob of money that you have associated to it. And that's a little more ideal than realistic with the way people do it, but it is there if you want to manage things that way. And your schedule is handled in a different way as well in the sense that you know that you'll be deploying something every week, and it's a bit of a trick with the schedule. Like, you're basically not committing to delivering something far into the future, which means it's hard to fail to, something you didn't, fail to deliver something you didn't commit to, right? But you, instead of thinking about a schedule and a bunch of functionality you get, instead what you're delivering as, as the team working on this is consistency, is velocity, is the idea that we, we can pretty reliably implement five things, whether it's a user story or a story point or if you're really old, a code point or whatever your unit of measurement is. And we know that we can accurately size and deliver this, this chunk of things. So it's more like a highway, right? You know how much traffic can go through it, but that really doesn't guarantee when you're going to get to grandma and grandpa's or anything like that. That's, that's a whole other question. And indeed, you see this kind of testimonial from E-Trade, an um, online trading company. And uh, basically, uh, when you present this kind of thinking to auditors and the people who are outside of development, they tend to really like a small batch approach more because it gives them a lot more insight and control of what's happening. So then let's, 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 let's look, at, uh, look at DevOps. As, as I said, this is one of the things that you end up needing, uh, it, it appears, when you're operating in this way, when you're delivering software every week, paying attention to the feedback and using it as a core enabler for your business. And for a long time, uh, you know, you can see I struggled to cite like the definitive source of what DevOps is down there and utterly failed at it, right? Like, for a long time, it's been really hard, uh, as I'll demonstrate here over the next minute or so, to crisply define what DevOps is beyond explaining what the expansion of the portmanteau of the two, the two words are. Uh, and, um, you know, it really, it, it's more, I think it's more interesting to think about how it came about. And it came about in, in the, the mid 2000s and the pressure of, I don't know what we called them back then, Web 2.0 companies or something, uh, but basically social companies or consumer companies that were under pressure to not only deliver functionality all the time, 
right? And we see this in our mobile app nowadays where your apps are updating all the time with those stupid release notes of like, we've improved it. And they put little jokey things in there, but they don't say anything. Uh, anyways, that used to happen all the time on the web. We just didn't really notice it. So they had to be delivering functionality to be competitive, to basically capture your eyeballs or whatever kind of nonsense they were doing back then. But functionality was, was how they did that. And at the same time, it was probably a good idea if the software actually worked and stayed running. So they needed uptime, right? Uh, and so figuring out that puzzle, how do you frequently release things and also guarantee uptime, like that seems like an impossible thing to do, is a lot of what brought about DevOps thinking, right? And over many years and many different versions of this, we used to think of this as agile infrastructure way back when, um, the idea was like, oh, if we have these two people merged together and they understand the roles of each other and how things actually run in production, what code does, we have a better idea of how to deliver things frequently and keep it up. And also, instead of focusing on uptime, we want resiliency. Like, things are going to break all the time, and they're going to come down. But instead, let's make sure that we can get them back up really quickly, right? Like, let's make sure that we're resilient and not so much uh, uh, focusing on uptime and things like that. So, you know, like I said, we've had a terrible way of de defining what it is. I think this, this book up here, which is actually not an early release anymore, uh, is, is one of the better, more recent overviews of it. If, if, if you can read through this book, it's, it's not encyclopedic enough that you get bored like halfway through and stop reading it. And it's actually quite delightful and, uh, and, and informative uh, a read through there. And there's, there's also, I, I would, uh, if you're interested, refer you to chapter eight of the Practice of Cloud System Administration, which is a fantastically concise overview of this from just a couple years ago. But recently, thanks to a lot of the work that uh, Puppet Labs and, and also Chef and uh, some other people have been doing, in particular, uh, uh, you know, Nicole and the folks she's been working with down there, she's really brought a nice academic discipline to this. And they just, they just came out, there's, there's basically the DevOps report is what I'm referring to. Just earlier, I think yesterday even, they released the 2016 version, which uh, I had a note in my head to go update this, but I didn't, so I apologize. Um, but, what, what they've done is through a bunch of, uh, I've got a philosophy degree, so I don't understand how math works. Uh, you know, they, they broke down that part of the Agora a long time ago. Uh, but through a bunch of like fancy math and science, what, what they've discovered is that there are certain characteristics that correlate with high performing organizations. And of course, they're centered on DevOps and they're very obsessed with that. And so if, if you look at the two charts I'm going to show you and read up on the study, on, the, uh, on your left side there are the practices that feed into enabling something like continuous delivery. And these are the mental benefits that you get down here if you're into that kind of thing. And then above are sort of like the organizational uh, characteristics that you achieve. So think about these practices as the things that you start doing if you want to operate in, in, in a DevOps fashion and get to this idea of, of being a, a better software company. And just like we did at the Agile chart, are these things you understand and are doing, and if not, how can you get to doing those things? Because it looks pretty likely that it's the, that a, a, an effect of, and this is where I use the wrong language academically, but an effect of using those things is that you become a better performing organization through the use of your software, right? So having continuous uh, test deployment and automation, automating as much as possible, testing as much as possible all throughout the cycle, focusing on continuous integration, which if you remember that chart, not that many people practice it as you would expect for something that seems so obviously healthy. It's, it's like flossing. We all know we should floss, and I won't ask anyone to raise their hands of who flosses and doesn't. I'm sure it's not a uh, common practice. Or maybe that's just more about me than you need to know. Uh, but there's this other interesting notion that's, that is strongly correlated, and that is really, and this gets to the DevOps notion, is tracking all of the artifacts you have, not only your source code, but your production configuration, your runtime information, as if it were part, as if, not as if it were part, but treating it like part of the product itself, something that you check in and do. And that has a lot of interesting side effects. When you hear people talking about version control being everywhere, that's, that's what they're getting to. So the second chart, that has this more organizational focus than practices is, again, here's some more practices, and there's actually some other ones they've added in the recent study, which you're interested in looking at, but the idea of focusing on limiting the work in progress that you have, which is not an exact match to a small batch thing, but it's basically like saying you should, you should finish things and ship them. And how you do that is you have smaller units of things, and you focus on shipping and doing something instead of having it laying around, right? Like, work in progress is the idea that if I need five components to build a thing, I'll batch up building the first five. Those will sit there. I'll batch up building, you know, unit three, and I'll have to delay, basically. It's kind of like a Gantt chart of stuff. 
and nothing ever gets shipped until everything is done. But instead, you focus on just moving one, as much as one piece as possible through the system when you're actually shipping something, and it focuses you to, do, to actually uh, do, do smaller batches of things. Anyhow, it's, it's something that they notice in the way that people think about software that, that in, uh, causes lean management and gives them better IT performance. And then there's, there's the idea of visualizing things a lot. Like, hopefully, most of the talks I've seen here, they have... I mean, this is a very crude representation of it, but they have a way of visualizing and monitoring what you're doing, right? And think about that at an application or a business level. Like, you want to know how your, your things are functioning. And then, and then there's also uh, focusing on actually monitoring, getting that feedback loop, at the, monitoring the business decisions to actually think about how the business is changing. So I just wanted to offer these two up because I think this is, these are the best, clearest definitions of what DevOps are at the moment. And you know, when, when, when we look at organizations who are taking into account uh, a lot of this small batch thinking, DevOps, all of this stuff I've been talking about, they're finding a fair amount of success, right? So Ford's a, a, a customer of Pivotal, so of course I have them up there. But you know, they're, they're a nice reference. There's, and there's all sorts of people who don't know anything about Pivotal who are having success with this as well, who are large organizations finding success with this approach. And if, if they can do it, it's definitely something that in your organization you can probably do as well. And, and I love this quote from a, a Forrester report. It's basically like we did a survey of, of things that we planned out to be a year versus a quarter, and things that we planned out to be released every three months had an 80% success rate. Rate, whereas things over a year, uh, you know, were basically the opposite. They had a 20% success rate. Now, you could sort of like, how many, how many like, uh, you know, footnotes on the on a, the the head of a pin situation thing you could do over that to to argue against it. But it basically kind of gets you the notion that focusing on smaller batches and this this user centric approach, there's success out there that people are doing. It's not necessarily crazy. So let's start closing out by looking at the tools that people are using, the the technologies. So this is a nice chart that represents kind of what I was uh, rambling through at the beginning, right? The nature of software, the tools you use, the way you architect it, the way you program it changes frequently, right? We go through all these cycles. Like, I've been told there were computers before 1970, but, you know, let's, let's just not worry about that so much. Uh, but, you know, the, the nature of how development is done based on the nature of how applications are delivered has changed a lot. And we're at the beginning of this cycle over on the, uh, the, the, the right side here where, you know, uh, as, as the not so fancily titled web and device, very descriptive, I mean, essentially it's cr causing the need for us to architect and program things in, in a different way, right? And again, because the, the applications have been changing around. So this is, this is yet another summary slide. I saw Mark yesterday had a good summary of microservices. That was delightful. But I think in the context of what I'm talking about, it's important to think about why you do microservices and the benefits you have from them and therefore, if you find yourself not getting those benefits, you want to make sure to refocus your efforts, right? So in the context of all of this, the reason you care about microservices is because it gives you a lot of agility and flexibility in your architecture. It allows you, because you have separate services that are run by different teams on their own timeline, it allows them, if you remember back to that work in progress analogy, it allows them to release new functionality in that service whenever they want to, right? You're not held back in any given service by the gigantic application, the monolith, if you will, right? So there's a, you know, an interesting excuse me, example of this is, let's say you have, uh, you're doing some sort of like address verification globally, right? Every address in every country, as you find out, is kind of handled differently. And you might think like, let's have a gigantic service that just handles resolving addresses and cleaning them up, a canonical representation. But more of a microservices approach, and this is kind of metaphoric, would be to have a whole bunch of different services per country, maybe like with another service strapped on top of it to figure out what country you are and like send it out to it. But it would basically allow you to come up with new types of address verification per country whenever you wanted to without having to be part of the release train of that gigantic thing. And if you think about that general approach, you can think about things like fraud detection or uh, shipping and logistics regionally and things like that. Like all these different, I forget the, the, the gang of four name for this thing where you've got like a specific implementation of a, uh, a way of doing something. But it's a good way of thinking about how, uh, you know, a, a microservices approach gives a nimbleness to your overall architecture. So if you find yourself lacking that nimbleness, right, if there's parts services that are held back by other ones, and you're still not able to release things on time, then maybe you're not really implementing this well and you're not getting the benefits of it. Because there are a bunch of problems with microservices, right? Like, it's not like a, a free lunch or a free ride. Like, you have to worry about managing them. And when you've got all these, these non-dependent things running around, uh, tracing and figuring out and doing root cause analysis when something goes wrong is kind of like a murder mystery, right? Like, you have no idea what happened, and if you don't have the right kind of tooling in place, you don't have visibility into all this stuff. 
And you know, of course, there may be incompatible APIs if things are releasing differently. Now, of course, the, 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 the best software practice when it comes to fixing errors is, is what I always like to refer to as the don't do that. So you could also not have incompatible APIs, which was a, a, big, a big Java thing for quite some time, and I guess all of eternity, if, if we're lucky. Uh, but you know, you have to deal with that kind of things and all sorts of shutdowns, and that's a lot of what you see uh, when people go over microservices is how to deal with those issues. So there are things you need to deal with, but make sure that if you're doing this approach, you're really getting the benefits of it, the, 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 the things of benefits and other things, other, other things that enable uh, that small batch approach that allows your business to start crafting the software as the core way of enabling things. And then just briefly, uh, you know, kind of what's emerged is that the way you actually do your code the, not only the code itself, but the discipline around how you talk, talk to each other in the code, how you store your version control, how you configure it, the way that you, can, you, uh, you, put your, you, know, you store your, your configuration externally instead of embedded in, in there, and so forth and so on. Like, you know, this is like a brilliant piece of, of marketing basically from Heroku a while ago, but it's really been taken over as, as more as a, a set of principles and approach that if you're developing in this style, here's a way to think about how you constrain your development and constrained in the good, good, good sense of the word and how you do that. So again, this is another more reference for you to go look these things up. I go read them every now and then, and each time I read them, they get more and more confusing, which is always delightful. But it kind of gives you a good basis to think about how, uh, how development is done um, in, in this new way of doing things. So the other thing that, that we notice, and uh, you know, what I spend my time doing, to be a little crass commercially, is there's often a platform that's running underneath this, right? And what do we, what do we mean by a platform? Well, uh, I'm sure you've read all these articles about how I got all these, uh, these container things and these new technologies to run in production and things like that. Well, what these, what these people who are writing this up done is they've built their own platform, right? They've figured out what is the stack of stuff I need. If I start with the dirt, and I've got to get a data center. I've got to get a data center, and I've got to get like a backplane and some wiring and some storage and some compute and some networking. And then I need an operating system, and then I need a way of placing the workloads and monitoring it, and on and on and on, right? And then and then I need some security and like and then oh, man, it's lunch break by that point, so I'm gonna get something to eat. But anyways, you're building out a platform that enables you to focus on basically running your software. Like you want to develop this software, this application, you need somewhere to run it. Like I went over the management problems that microservices have as one example. You need something that monitors for it and does your health checks and does everything that you need for it. So at the end of the day, you're presented with this blinking cursor and you can finally start writing your application and deploy it. So uh, you know, this, is, this is kind of a very technical diagram in, in, in the, world I come, the platform world I come from in Cloud Foundry. A lot of what's done under there, right? Running on top of infrastructure and adding in a bunch of the middleware services and things like that. And there's some references down there, but that's the next, technolo the next tool I would encourage you to look at is instead of building your own platform and, and dealing with two problems, the application you originally wanted to do in the platform, there's lots of platforms out there now that, that you can use that are, are not sort of uh, onerous or terrible or anything like that, and, and there's uh, plenty of people using them and finding success. So enough of the tooling stuff. Let's, let's, let's end out by, you know, if you're in an organization, right, and your development team has, has really, like, uh, figured things out and you're all crazy and you want to have the larger organization start to do things in a new way, right, you're going to get to this last phase of transformation. Uh, and you might even want to put the word digital in front of it if you want to be all fancy. But thinking about how you transform an organization around is where you start to get the big effects of doing all of this, right? If you're, you know, at one of these big banks or telcos and you, don't change, you only change one team and not the whole organization, it's not really going to be effective, right? You're sort of, uh, you know, if, if you've got a, a damaged patient and you give them like a, a really nice shirt uh, that's well tailored and fits them well, and they're, you know, they're still going to die unless you kind of fix the core problem. So you want to focus on the, the whole thing, the large organization and transform. And, you know, there's probably a crowd, unlike many that I present this to, who, who gets the joke there. Uh, anyways, uh, so the first thing that I don't think it's necessarily counterintuitive, but I don't really find that people start with this very much is, you're, the first gate you need to get through is that you're only going to be successful if management are the first people who start changing and transforming, right? Like, it's really key. Like, the whole thing of a large organization, unless you're working at one of these places that supposedly has no managers or sales team or these weird, you know, this is why I have that unicorn slide up there. But if you're working in probably a regular company, it's really management who has the biggest effect on change and things happening, right? And I don't think management necessarily thinks about that a lot. They're usually focused a lot more on just maintaining the current success of the organization and making sure it doesn't all melt down, right? Like they want to maintain the, what they have. So management, when you're wanting to transform and become better at software and therefore a, a more competitive, better business, 
they need to shift their mindset over to being the change managers. They have to, in the same way that you as an engineer or a development team might take a small batch approach and think about how do we solve this problem with software, management has to look at the organization they have as the system they're coding and discovering and think how they change that system and organization around. They need to come up with theories of how they do things, run, run the traps of it and the experiments, and act accordingly afterwards. And this often requires reorganizing things, changing the way you compensate people, all sorts of manner of things, which can be extremely difficult, if not impossible, and sometimes you end up setting up a whole new organization, right? Like, sometimes the, uh, the best way to plant some crops is just to burn the fields down and plant something new. And, and so you might have these parallel organizations set up and things like that, but again, it all comes back to management doing this, right? An individual can only go so far. It's not like the movies where just all of a sudden you're in the elevator with the CEO and then you're running the division like the Hudsucker proxy or something, right? And that doesn't turn out well either. But Really, in the real world, like management needs to focus on doing change. And I think there's two really great references, uh, and, and I'll get into a little use case as well, that, that highlighting uh, a seemingly trivial but important aspect where you can test if management is actually changing. But this one book, Leading the Transformation, is great. It goes over from a management perspective how you transform into doing DevOps and a lot of what I've talked about. And while it's a bit dated, uh, this book by my friend Israel Gatt, if, if you're the kind of management person who wants metrics and all that kind of stuff, it's a, it's a good short overview of bridging from traditional ways of thinking about management into a more agile way of doing things. So at this point, so ad management wants to change the organization. This is kind of the first thing that, that, that they usually protest about, the first Eeyore uh, uh, complaining that they have. And that is that like, oh, my people suck, which is sort of like big thumbs up for your belief in your organization management. Uh, but you know, it, it's, it's a legit complaint to kind of look at those, those, cat, those uh, unicorn riding cats and be like, I don't have the kind of vats required to grow that kind of mutant, right? Like I, I don't, I have a very limited budget. And, and this was documented in Twitter, so it must have happened. Uh, but like, there's this apocryphal conversation where someone was complaining to, to Adrian Kokrov, this is my obligatory Adrian reference of the presentation, uh, they'll let me back in the country now. Um, but they were complaining to him that they couldn't hire these people, and he kind of quit back, well, we just hired them from you. It's not like we have these vats, we just set up a culture and an organization that allowed the very same people you had to thrive and do well. And indeed, I mean, that's the approach that you need to take is that you probably have the people or can hire the people to do this. You need to set up the right kind of environment. And then as that, that trivial use case, so here's, here's a friend of mine I do one of my, uh, one of my other podcasts with where we talk with companies about transforming and, and how they do things. And he had a great talk a few weeks ago about how at Allstate, a large uh, insurance company he works at, how their management has been changing and therefore their organization has been changing. And, and you can read the quote there, but... What's, what's interesting about this is, uh, you know, to have my Yogi Berra or Zen-like type of, of thing there, like, if you really want to change, you need to think about changing your behavior, which changes your process. And as one tracer of that, right, they spend a lot of time on t-shirts, because, you know, technical people love t-shirts. You can tell I don't really care. Uh, but t-shirts are apparently a big deal in, in getting people to uh, pay attention to things. So they've got that, that pretty cool one. And, and their, their VP of their unit would show up at their all-hands meetings, not dressed very nicely like he is, but dressed in a hoodie and a t-shirt and, you know, pal around with people. And more so than being just like symbols and, and kind of fakery, they were actually, management was genuinely involved in things and changing themselves. They had transformed away. And he had also won that trust by doing these small changes and these small things. And staff actually believed that change was happening, and then change does start happening. And then at that point, you don't need to show up in a hoodie necessarily. It's, it's much more comfortable, I guess, than wearing a suit. Uh, but once people are actually contributing in the change and staff believe in it, change actually does start happening, and that's its own proof that your meatware is improving, that things are going well. So, you know, if, if you want to see more of the ways, the sort of management tricks that, they, that Matt and others have been deploying, it's, it's, it's a good talk to go look at. So before we, we wrap up, another thing that comes up frequently when transforming is uh, dealing with legacy, right? So the first thing is, what is legacy software? I mean, I always think of, there's all sorts of definitions. I think, I think Michael Feather's definition, right? Like legacy code is code that's not tested, but to you know, change legacy code, you've got to write tests, and then you've got like the legacy coder's dilemma and all sorts of fun stuff like that. But basically, I think about legacy code as more or less any code that you're afraid to change, but you have to, right? Like, it doesn't really matter why you're afraid to change it, but if you think about it, if there's code that you ha you'd like to change and you don't really worry about it, it's probably not legacy. You would never think of that as legacy code. That's just 
your code. You only really put the word legacy in front of something if you don't like it, if you don't want to change it. And it's usually because you don't have tests and so forth and so on. But to get around that, to transform around that, what I notice, and some companies have this, but again, at a management level, at an organization level, they get in this situation because they don't have good portfolio management in place. They haven't figured out which applications are low enough priority to just kind of virtualize and forget, or outsource or decommission. And instead, they've just got this big pile of differentiated stuff, like a bunch of old empty sandwich wrappers they don't know what to do with. And what you need to do is keep your, your portfolio more tidy. That's what portfolio management is. So ask yourself, as an organization, do we have portfolio management? What type of thing are we following? And if you don't know, you should probably find out. And if you don't have one, you should put one in place, because then you're going to be stuck with a bunch of legacy software afterwards. So just wrapping up, here's just briefly some proof points, right? Like in our US federal government, we have a lot of people working on this, and it's actually working for them. You know, If our federal government can do it, it's definitely something that's, that's possible for most anyone to. Uh, and and there's, there's all sorts of companies referenced over here who are finding success with this approach, and uh, things are working quite well for them. Most, the most recent one here is from Comcast, like a gigantic uh, big telco provider uh, in, in America. And they've been able to get their, their release times down to, to, to minutes and you know, down to weeks and things like that by taking an approach like this. And uh, it's worked out well for them. So I, uh, I, I wrote a little 80-page book or so. Actually, I think it's only like 30-page. Uh, and if you're interested in more of this, you can get it for free. Just go to cote.io slash pivotal. And it just goes into three different types of projects and how to think about them with, with, with as you can probably guess, plenty of references to dig in more deep. But there, it's a good start if you want to get beyond the uh, now two minutes over uh, version of, of what's going on here. And finally, in August, uh, if you're interested in spring and all of this, or, or uh, digital transformation, we've got our conference uh, in Las Vegas, uh, if, if you want to come check that out. It's, uh, you can come talk to me. I'll give you $300 off if you're into discounts. Uh, but it, it'll, be a, it'll be a fun conference. Uh, and, and if you like the weather today, you'll love the weather in Vegas in August. So with that, thank you. I, uh, I appreciate you having me and uh, going over a little bit. I'm uh, happy to answer questions up here for anyone who's interested in it. Thanks.